All right, I'm going to bring us back to our deck and say, once again, welcome to the first focus area meeting for the Long Island City Neighborhood Plan, this evening focusing on housing. Thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Bahish Chansey. I'm the Director of Urban Planning at WXY Studio, and our design and planning firm is working with the City Planning Department and Council Member One's team on this planning process. We're going to get going with our program in a moment here, but before I do, I'm going to first hand it over to Council Member One to give introductory remarks to the folks in the room. Thank you so much, Bahish. Good evening, everybody. It's so good to see you all. Thank you for joining us on this wonderful Monday night. Welcome to the first meeting and a series of public engagement events that are part of the Long Island City Neighborhood Study. My name is Julie Wan, I'm your current council member. I represent Long Island City, Sunnyside, Woodside, and Astoria. This is part of a larger comprehensive planning process that we're doing all throughout our district in partnership with DCP at WXY for Long Island City and for Roosevelt Avenue and Northern Boulevard in in the other parts with Hester Street. Tonight's meeting, we're gonna focus on housing, which I believe is the most important, especially affordable housing. And citywide, we have over 50% of households that are rent burdened, spending more than a third of their income on rent. And in Long Island City, especially in Queensbridge area, 40% of households are rent burdened. So right now our vacancy rate for apartments for our monthly rent below $1,500 is less than 1%. And we are continuing to see a rise and we'll see more data shared by DCP as well as WXY throughout this um, deck. We have heard you loud and clear that your one of your top concerns are for affordable housing. So you'll see more data sets shared later on in the presentation. Right now, our, we are in a humanitarian crisis with an influx of migrants that, ha that have brought in more than 121,000 people into our homeless shelters throughout our city. In our district alone, we have more than 8,000 individuals and families who are living in temporary shelter. We want to make sure that all of these issues get addressed. So we look forward to working with you. Thank you for making time. I hope you will continue to join us. We have upcoming focus meetings on December 16th on economic development, arts, culture, and community resources. Then on December 18th, we will focus on public realm, transportation, resiliency, and open space. So I just want to thank my team. Um, Isaac Blazenstein is on, my land use director, as well as Gregory and Ariana. And I want to thank the DCP team and the WXY team for all their hard work. And I look forward to hearing all of your feedback today. Thank you so much. And I'll pass it back to Bahich. Thank you so much, Council Member One. I'm now going to turn it over to Alexis Wheeler at the Department of City Planning to open up. Thank you, Mahish. Hello, Long Island City. Uh, we really appreciate your presence today and we value your time as we collaborate together on a shared vision for the neighborhood. We're really encouraged by the participation and, and turnout tonight. Um, I also wanna thank council member one for her leadership and partnership in this really exciting neighborhood planning process. Um, I also want to acknowledge and thank WXY for their excellent uh, community collaboration and the work that all of the different city agencies are doing along with DCP here. So thank you so much for all of the great heavy lifting that we're all doing um, and, and the time, but we're really excited for what all of these focus area meetings are going to entail as we are launching into these deeper rounds of engagement with all of you. It's a really great opportunity for all of us to again, hear more about what you are experiencing on the ground what you have been seeing in the neighborhood over time and really what we need to see to create a neighborhood that will thrive well into the future. We want to find a way to create a more resilient and a more equitable community with all of you. So again, we really thank your participation, but we are still only at the beginning. We have more focus area meetings to come. So please, I hope everyone has already registered for the meetings that we have on both the 16th and the 18th of this month. And we have many more continuing into the new year. So we look forward to all of you continuing to join us along this process. And uh, you're also welcome to reach out to us throughout the process outside of these meetings. Uh, we have our website, of course, and we'll continue to share any updates as we uh, continue this process together. So again, thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing from every single one of you tonight. Thank you. 
And back to you, Bahish. Great, thank you so much, Alexis. All right, let's get going. Before we do, I do want to note that we have interpretation channels that are currently available in Spanish, Mandarin, and Bengali. Um, in order to switch the language you hear, you can go and select the globe icon at the at the bottom of your Zoom window. You should be able to switch into any of those different interpretation channels there. I'm now going to hand it over to our interpreters in order to give that announcement to the full room. And I'll start off with our Spanish interpreter. Sí, bueno, buenas, buenas noches, ¿me escuchan? Can you hear me? Yep. Sí, sí, buenas. Eh, para los que hablan español y quieren el servicio de traducción en español, en la parte de abajo van a ver el icono eh, para interpretaciones. Eh, tiene, es como un globo terráqueo. Pueden darle... Eh, link, eh, pueden darle clic ahí y entrarán al cuarto de interpretación en español. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Now turning it over to our Mandarin interpreters. Hello,呃呃，朋友，呃，关注长岛市的发展的朋友，大家好。今天晚上的会议呢，我们是有呃华语、西班牙语。和孟加拉语的翻译服务的，如果呢你想要收听翻译服务，可以在现在显示屏下方有一个好像地球圆形的这个按钮，按一下，然后选择中文，你就可以收到呃翻译服务。谢谢，Thank you. And finally, I will ask our Bengali interpreters. আচ্ছা আমার নাম মীরা আমি বাংলায় অনুবাদ করব অনুষ্ঠানটা আপনারা বাংলায় যদি শুনতে চান আপনাদের নিচে ওখানে অপশনে গিয়ে আপনারা বাংলাটা চুজ করবেন বাংলাটা যখন আপনারা চুজ করবেন তখন আপনারা বাংলা অনুবাদটা এখানে শুনতে পারবেন ঠিক আছে আপনাদের কোনো প্রশ্ন থাকলে আপনারা চ্যাট বক্সে লিখতে পারবেন ওঠো আমরা উত্তর দেব ধন্যবাদ All right, interpreters will now be placed back into their channels and folks should see that uh, globe icon on Zoom so that you can change your language in a moment. All right, folks, getting into this evening's program. All right, first, a little note on what this evening will include. We'll first do an overview of the day's objectives as well as the 1LIC planning process. What is this whole project? Next, we'll review what we heard at the kickoff meeting as it relates in particular to housing and land use. Then we'll break for a couple of live polling questions. We'll then come back and share some info about housing and zoning in the study area and the tools that the city has to try to achieve affordability. Then the largest portion of this evening's meeting is held for breakout group discussions, where we will ask you all to do two things in groups. The first would be to workshop the issues and opportunities that we heard at the kickoff and start to think through with us the topics that will be addressed in this community plan. And the second would be to help us define a set of housing-related community-defined goals. So getting to this evening's objectives, we have four key goals. First, we want to share what we heard at the kickoff meeting. Next, like I said, we'll present housing-related existing conditions, the tools that the city has to develop new housing, including affordable housing, and the tools to preserve existing housing and affordable housing. And then, as we get into breakout rooms, we are going to work to develop housing related issues and opportunities and finalize a set of neighborhood plan goals for housing. So first off, what is this planning process? One LIC is a holistic community planning process to gain input and build consensus on key neighborhood challenges and opportunities toward the development of a Long Island City neighborhood plan. It's critically important that the LIC neighborhood plan is not just a proposal for land use changes. Holistic community planning includes understanding how proposed land use changes may affect Long Island City and ensuring that a complementary and timely set of investments in infrastructure, community services, and city policies supports sustainable growth and strengthens the community for everyone. So let's talk about where we're talking about. The preliminary study area outlined here represents the area that the city planning department is considering for land use changes. The bulk of the area is between 59th Street Bridge and Annabelle Basin, from the East River on the west to the 24th Street on the east. 
It includes a few blocks south to 47th Avenue between 5th Street and 11th Street, and a few blocks north to, of the Queensboro Bridge to 39th Avenue between 21st and 23rd Streets. This gray dotted line surrounding the area is what we're calling the context area. This area would not be under consideration for land use changes, but it's important to account for this immediate context in our planning efforts. Investments in infrastructure, facilities, and services may also happen within this context area to support changes that happen in the study area. The study area includes a large portion of the LIC Industrial Business Zone, the IBZ. The IBZ has great opportunities to support job growth and workforce development and can adapt to meet the needs of today's economy and the area's growing businesses. There's also a wealth of small businesses and manufacturers who bump elbows with artists and cultural facilities in this area. These folks also stand to benefit from city investments and the city needs to allow for and support their growth. Although the study area is along the East River, there's currently no public waterfront access. This is an opportunity to rethink how Long Island City meets the water. There are incredible opportunities to connect the Gantry Plaza State Park to the south with Queensbridge Park to the north and create a continuous waterfront access. This is also the time to plan for coastal resilience and adaptive infrastructure that prepares us to live with the impacts of climate change. There are some opportunities in this area to allow for new housing, which we're here to talk about this evening, and a neighborhood rezoning allows us to mandate that every new development include affordable housing. Finally, investments in transportation and climate infrastructure, street safety and open space, and city services and education will ensure that the community is ready to sustain residential growth and job growth. The city and council member one understand this plan as an opportunity to generate significant new housing, including affordable housing, to deliver new high quality open space along the waterfront and in the neighborhood's core, to enhance connectivity and multimodal transportation options, to plan for infrastructure and resiliency, to increase the number of local jobs and expand workforce training, to invest in neighborhood services, education and programs, and to lead through an equitable and inclusive process. These goals represent preliminary draft goals. And part of what we are going to do together at this meeting is to create more specific and actionable goals for housing that will guide the community plans recommendations. At the kickoff meeting, some of what we heard reinforced these draft goals, but we also heard a lot of other great ideas. At this first round of focus area meetings, we'll be developing a stronger set of community defined goals to advance this planning work. As we go through this project, there are multiple ways to engage in the process. Broad outreach events are going to help us meet people where they are. We'll be popping up at community events to bring more people into this discussion. Town halls are places to share major updates and seek community feedback on the plan. Focus area meetings, where we are today, are discussion-based, concentrated public work sessions where we can tackle specific topic areas that relate to the plan. Happy to be with you virtually tonight, and we also look forward to doing these with folks in person as we continue through this process. And finally, the plans website at licplan.org is the place to find all the past documents and see what we've heard to date. We also encourage you all to join the mailing list there and to stay informed about this planning process. Today's focus area is all about housing. We're discussing how and where there are opportunities to develop housing, including affordable housing, and how the city can best protect existing tenants. We also wanna know how this plan can support and preserve public housing and other important sites in the area. The next two focus area meetings will focus on economic and workforce development, arts and culture and community resources. That meeting will be on December 16th and the public realm transportation, waterfront resiliency and open space, which will be on the 18th. As we look at our timeline, we came out of the kickoff meeting with a lot of issues and opportunities that the public hopes to see addressed in the plan. Coming into this first round of focus area meetings, we'll be building on what we heard there, and we seek to finalize the plan's goals at this meeting tonight about housing. We'll take the finalized plan goals that we come up with in focus area meetings round one into round two, where we'll finalize the set of issues and opportunities to address in the community plan. In round two, we'll also workshop some potential solutions and community recommendations to include. At Town Hall two, 
will come back to the public with a draft set of community recommendations based on the goals, issues, and opportunities defined up to that point. We'll use that public forum to refine those recommendations and bring updates back to the public in the third round of focus area meetings. In the third round, we'll further workshop the community recommendations and share high-level thoughts on draft zoning frameworks that would be used to develop the draft plan. And at Town Hall 3, we'll present the draft plan and the draft zoning framework for community feedback before the plan is finalized and moves into environmental review scoping processes. Okay, now let's discuss a bit of what we heard at that kickoff event. First, thank you to everybody who was able to come out and join us at the project kickoff event at Culture Lab. There were over 220 attendees and representatives from 15 city agencies. Across 10 topic-based stations, we received over 1,000 comments. Synthesizing all of what we heard through conversation and people's written feedback is a big task, and it is also the key purpose of our public engagement work. We listen so that the community plan can represent what we hear from people. To begin this synthesis, we take all the staff's written notes and every post-it and sticker upvote that's recorded and we categorize them into a system. While, while it's the content and it's the ideas that are shared in each individual note that we use most directly in developing the plan's recommendations, it's also helpful for us to sort comments into topic areas and themes to get a broader understanding of what's on people's minds. Comments were sorted into categories that are listed here economic and workforce development, arts and culture, housing, land use and zoning, climate adaptation and resilience, open space and public realm, and community resources. The full What We Heard summary document is available on the plan's website. Today, we'll review a bit of what we heard about housing and land use and zoning as they relate to today's discussion. While we show the number of comments that were received for each issue and opportunity, remember, these are not votes. An issue with a lot of comments is not necessarily more important than those that just have a few. Within housing, we sorted comments into two major themes, preserving affordability and future development priorities. More than any other topic, we received the most comments on the need for permanent and deeply affordable housing. There were also concerns about residential displacement from the area, and ideas to keep people in their affordable homes by investing in public housing and providing multiple pathways to home ownership. Proposed investments at NYCHA included things like landscape and safety improvements and green spaces, improvements to shared lobby spaces and sanitation improvements. People wanted to see housing that works for differently sized families and a mix of options that may also include live and work spaces. In thinking through future development, people offered their hopes that community-led organizations can be part of new projects and that new projects would not only result in luxury housing. Others offered ideas for the reuse of manufacturing buildings to adapt them for residential use. As we looked at land use and zoning, while we heard some concerns about increasing density, we also had many comments from people who were receptive to density as a strategy to provide more housing. People shared ideas for public amenities that they hoped to see as the result of a new development. These included things like thoughtfully planned green and open spaces, a waterfront greenway, and schools and community centers to serve the area's residents. We also received specific ideas about repurposing parking lots and repair shops, and support to keep public lands and facilities for public and community uses. Now this represents just a summary of the many, many things we heard. And like I said, we have gone through and actually typed in and written up every one of your comments that you shared at that kickoff meeting. We're very excited to start including some of that into the draft recommendations that are the result of this community plan. And excited to bring that back out to you all as a community so that we can start to workshop those things together. Now, next up, we're gonna talk a little bit about today's particular focus area, housing give some background information so we can all enter conversations informed as we get into breakout groups. But before we do that, we're gonna take a brief pause and we're gonna poll folks once more on a couple issues around housing for this community plan. After that, we're gonna jump into that topic specific stuff. But before we do, please once more, take out your phones or go to menti.com. Please enter the code there. And Moon, if you wouldn't mind dropping the 
the link into the chat for folks to respond. You can just click the link in the chat. It'll take you to your browser where you can respond to the poll for this segment of the meeting. And Moon, when you're ready, you can take screen share and start to show results. All right, thank you very much, Moon. So our first question here is, are there types of households or people that face the most barriers to accessing or remaining in housing? One of the things a community plan like this can do is to try to protect folks who are in housing and try to improve access for folks to get into housing. So I'm gonna wait a moment here for the results to start to come in. I'm seeing a good number of them starting to trickle in now, but we got a lot of folks in the meeting who I think have not yet had their chance to answer this poll. So Moon, stay on this slide while we allow folks to start to submit their responses here. Hey, folks. Thank you. We're seeing a lot of responses come into the poll now. Households with children and unhoused families and individuals ranking highly. People with disabilities and seniors also ranking highly in this answer. And then folks, young adults are having trouble accessing housing and then people leaving prison and re-entering the community single people ranking a little bit lower here. And as I said, if you've put your answer into other, we certainly invite you to put the people who you're thinking about into the chat. And thanks, I see a few people mentioning artists in the chat. All right, folks. Moon, if you can please move us to our next question in this poll, this should move folks together. So we have a few issues related to accessing housing that are listed out here. And we wanna understand from you all uh, where these rank for you. In Mentimeter, you can rank these from first, second, third, and fourth, as they appear to be the biggest challenges you see, the things that are most important as a barrier to those that are least important. So folks, we'll ask you to start ranking these so we can get an understanding of the types of issues that our programs and policies from the city can help to address in Long Island City. I'll give folks a minute here to continue to answer our poll. And 
as folks are having their answers come in, I'm seeing the number one challenge that folks feel there is to accessing housing in the area is that housing costs are too high. It's something that we heard repetitively at the kickoff meeting, and it's something I'm sure we're going to continue to hear. Many of the tools that we're going to discuss tonight are targeted exactly at trying to address housing costs and ensure that there is affordable housing across the area. So we're excited to share some of those tools with you and think through the best ways to apply those in Long Island City. After housing costs being too high, we have units that are available are too big or too small for the people who are looking for housing. So there's not really a good match between the units that are existing in the market and what people actually need. Next up, we have that housing quality is poor or that landlords are slow to make repairs. And then finally, we have that folks are living in overcrowded conditions, which is related to the unit size that's needed and housing affordability, absolutely. All right, folks, I'm gonna take us back into our meeting deck and we are gonna talk about some of the specific tools that the city has to address housing and some of the things that would be changed if land use changes, go ahead. All right. So we know that many folks are gonna be familiar with some of this info, but many may also not be. We're gonna have a more productive conversation if we all get on the same page. So apologies to folks who may feel this is familiar content ahead of time. So the housing in the context area covers a wide range of types. There's smaller two and three story buildings to mid rise private and public housing up to taller residential towers in Hunters Point and Court Square. Since 2010, there has been a significant amount of new housing created in the surrounding area. Of 21,000 new units constructed in that time period, around one in five have reserve, are reserved to serve middle income families who earn up to 120% of the area median income. Much of this income restricted housing was developed under New York State's 421A program, which required developers to build these units as a portion of their overall construction. The 421A program is now expired and developers are no longer held to this requirement. Most of the new housing produced in the context area has been outside the study area as the study area is mostly industrially zoned. When we look at the portion of people's income that goes to rent, we see that residents in the context area on average are less rent burdened than people living throughout Queens or New York City as a whole. That said, 43% uh, or three in seven local families are still burdened or severely rent burdened. The tenant is considered rent burdened when they spend 30% of their income on rent and severely rent burdened when they spend more than 50% of their income. Citywide, Rent has increased faster than people's income over the last several decades. The monthly average rent now accounts for 34% of the average monthly income citywide. In recent years, especially since the pandemic's significant amount of rental turnover, we've seen rent increase a lot. That increase has hit this area harder than borough-wide or citywide increases. When we disaggregate the citywide housing crisis, we see the problem acutely affects lower income families. For a family of three earning $50,000 per year, less than 1% of the units in their price range are available to rent. The proportion of available units for higher earners is not so tight and offers families a greater amount of housing choice. Due to the housing growth the area has seen in recent years, there've also been some demographic shifts. Today, the context area has more white and Asian residents than the citywide proportion, while it has fewer Hispanic and black residents than the citywide proportion. As the area has grown, its median income has also increased significantly, leading to the earlier point that rent burden in the surrounding area is lower than the citywide average. Before we hop into breakout rooms, it's important that we also discuss zoning, the primary tool that the city has to regulate what can be built where and to require the construction of affordable units. Zoning regulations set the maximum size and height of buildings, as well as what types of buildings, residential, manufacturing, or commercial, can be built where. The city uses this power to guide harmonious development, regulate growth, and advance policy priorities. 
The next couple of slides will take a look at some of the different types of zoning that exist through the LIC area. Looking at a residential district or an R district as they're sometimes called, like R7A, which is zoned on parts of 44th Drive, we see that the zoning sets the maximum height, the levels at which the facade has to step back from the street wall, and other density controls like the amount of the lot that can be covered. Zoning can also grant bonus density in exchange for developers including amenities for the public good, things like new green space or a portion of affordable inclusionary housing units. In the table at the bottom, you can see that inclusionary R7A buildings with affordable apartments can be built up to 10 feet taller than non-inclusionary buildings. Zoning does not regulate everything, however. It can't require that all units in a building be affordable. It also can't require that certain types of units will be built. It can't, for example, specify that they should all be three bedroom units or they should all be studios. Residential buildings can also allow for commercial uses like stores on the ground floor if there's a commercial overlay. Manufacturing districts or M districts cover the majority of the one LC study area. The area's M1 zones allow various types of light manufacturing, including things like artist studios and breweries. M districts also allow for commercial and office space, but residential buildings are not allowed in M districts. If the city changes the zoning rules in an area, it does not require existing buildings to change. Any building that's already there can continue as it was, and it's the building's owner who decides if they wish to redevelop their property under the new zoning rules. The city cannot require buildings to be demolished or built through zoning. Zoning also cannot control an area's architectural or aesthetic style. Mixed use or MX zones are a special district type that allows a mix of buildings. This flexible type of zoning allows multiple uses to exist alongside each other even in the same building, including residential, commercial, and manufacturing. The nearby Dutch Kills neighborhood is one example of an MX zone. The zone can specify which types of commercial or industrial space would work in harmony with adjacent residential uses. While zoning has the ability to restrict some types of commercial use like big box and large scale retail by setting things like the size of storefronts, it can't require that a certain type of business or store locate in a building. Zoning also does not have the power to regulate commercial business rents. Here's the area's existing zoning on the right and its existing land use on the left. On the zoning map, the purple areas are for manufacturing, yellow are for residential use, and the orange zone is a special mixed use zone. You can see in the land use map that there are certain residential lots in the M zoned area. These buildings either predate the current zoning or the property owner has received a single lot variance through a private application. A community wide rezoning is an opportunity for you as a community to plan proactively for the types of uses and density that work throughout the area for the area's growth. Now let's discuss some of the tools that come along with zoning. Mandatory inclusionary housing, or as you'll hear it called MIH, is the city's key tool to guarantee that newly built housing in rezoned areas includes affordable units. Under MIH, 20 to 30% of a new building's units must be permanently affordable. MIH is a relatively new policy. It was passed in 2016. So only a few areas that were rezoned since then, those shown in the map in red, mandate inclusionary housing. Before this, developers could opt into the program in some areas, but were not required to build inclusionary units. The level of MIH affordability is tied to the area median income, AMI, which is determined by the Federal Housing and Urban Development Department, HUD. MIH units are rent stabilized and reserved for lower and moderate income families who earn some portion of the area median income, the AMI. The maximum rent in MIH apartments depends on family size. There are th three main MIH options that the city can map in a rezoning. Some options require more units to be affordable at a higher income, like option two, which requires 30% of units affordable at an average 80% AMI. 
and some require fewer units to be affordable at a lower income, like option one, requiring 25% of units to be affordable at an average 60% of AMI. Within a single building, there may be some higher AMI and some lower AMI units. These AMIs represent the average for the whole building. Now let's discuss a few of the tools that the city has in order to keep housing affordable. Multiple city agencies, including the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, HPD, the Department of City Planning, and the New York City Housing Authority work together in a community plan toward the goal of affordable housing. We'll discuss some tools that HPD uses to keep housing affordable. HPD has three core strategies to keep housing costs lower. The first here, rent stabilization, protects households from sudden rent increases. This tool typically applies to older buildings with over six units. It also applies to new HPD developed and or administered housing, including inclusionary housing. Income restriction is another important tool here. That ensures that affordable housing units are reserved for lower income families who most need it. The housing that HPD develops or administers, such as mandatory inclusionary housing is income restricted. And rent burden protection means that a household's rent always stays affordable to them at no more than 30% of their income, even if their rent or income changes. For example, this is the case for NYCHA residents, as well as families who receive rent vouchers. The city's Housing Preservation and Development Department focuses on preserving affordable housing and building affordable housing on city-owned land. They do this by protecting and supporting tenants and homeowners through programs like rental assistance and protection against harassment. HPD also offers low interest loans to finance affordable housing repairs. When it comes to producing new affordable housing, HPD builds 100% affordable housing on city owned sites or in collaboration with private landowners where possible. HPD also administers the development of MIH housing wherever the planning department has required it through zoning. All right, folks, that's a little bit of background here. There's a lot more detail you can jump into around housing, but we wanted to give a few tools so that folks feel they're at least on the same page with some of the basics. With some of this background, we're now gonna jump into breakout rooms to start our discussion. We're gonna sort into breakout groups to get into a deeper conversation about the plans, issues, and opportunities, and we'll also use the time to workshop the draft goals. We encourage all the participants to show video and unmute themselves to join the conversation in the breakout rooms, but participation in the chat is also appreciated. Each breakout room will have the same discussion material and will be focused on the same set of topics. We apologize in advance if we relocate anyone from one room to another. It's only going to be done to rebalance the group sizes. And participants will be randomly assigned into six breakout rooms. A few community agreements before we jump into breakout rooms for discussion. First, we'll ask everyone, please share the airtime. Be cognizant if you've spoken a lot and just take a step back to allow everybody to, in, to join the conversation. We, we ask folks, respect the diverse viewpoints and experiences of the folks who are in the group. Together, we know quite a lot, but individually, no single one of us knows it all. So when we come together for these conversations, we come out with stronger outcomes. To that end, we ask folks to use I statements and try to speak from your own experience. Please attempt to avoid kind of generalizations that would speak for everyone. And finally, I ask folks to check their negativity bias. It can be very easy in a conversation like this to come in and sort of quickly strike down other folks' ideas or dismiss something that you don't think is feasible or good. I encourage folks to check that first impulse and try to have a constructive discussion. Uh, instead of focusing on what you don't like about something, you may ask an idea, a question of the person, and further explore their idea a bit. If you need interpretation services, interpreters will remain in the main room. If you need language interpretation, please write the language you need in the chat and we'll unassign you from a breakout room. We'll have those folks in the main room. Everybody else will be split out into the breakout rooms. Each group will have one facilitator and one note taker. Your facilitator will lead the group through two activities. 
The first is to workshop the issues and opportunities. And the second is to develop housing related goals for the community plan. Your facilitator will talk you through this in a little bit more detail. I'll also note that we're going to use a tool called Jamboard in order to take interactive notes with one another. You are welcome to take your own notes. The note taker will share the link to your group's Jamboard in the chat, and you can drop post-its over the boards and share your thoughts in that way if you prefer not to come out on audio. However, you are not required to do that. If you prefer to just give your comment audibly or type it in the chat, we'll ensure that the note taker in your group works to uh, ensure that it's recorded. As we get into breakout rooms, we're going to be discussing issues and opportunities that we heard about housing and land use so far. We'll ask participants to think through the following framework. We want to know the areas where you see potential and opportunity in the area. We want to know the things that you feel may be missing from the study area today that a community plan like this may help to address. We're looking for the barriers and the challenges that you hope this plan can face. And we also want to know the things that you love about your homes in Long Island City and that you want to see safeguarded as part of this community plan. All right, I'm now going to drop our screen share. Please allow a moment for your group's facilitator to join the breakout group and in a moment and just give us a little bit of patience as we get everybody into the right discussion rooms. Uh, with that, Olivia, if you can please go ahead and open the breakout rooms uh, and facilitators and note takers please go ahead and join those breakout rooms that you're assigned to. Thank you. Uh, yes, I don't know if I'm still now speaking to the whole group or to the uh, group to say that, yes, we need truly new thinking about how to come up with new ways to go for deep affordability. And Thank at this you, time, for sharing that point out. You're back in the full group here, and I do want to address the full meeting while we're back. Thank you for finishing your point there. Okay, that's it. Folks, welcome back into the full group here. Um, we had a nice breakout room discussion there, started to get into some of the issues and opportunities around the plan. Uh, I heard some really good comments that'll help us as we move ahead in some of this planning work that'll help us frame what we need to think through as we think through housing, as we think through investing in the existing assets in the area, the things people love so much about Long Island City and about the places that you think that there are ancillary things that need to be thought through, like relationships with climate change adaptation and resilience, other topics like that. I'm gonna invite the folks to uh, who are note-taking to talk through a little bit of the topics that were discussed in each of your breakout rooms. As we go through that, I'm gonna ask Olivia, looks like you're already on it, to share screen and kind of flip through a little bit of what was recorded during that discussion. Duncan, I'm gonna go ahead and invite you as the note taker for the first room to talk a little bit about some of the key points that were discussed uh, as, as we talked through in our group. Excuse me, thank you, Vahij. I think a lot of our group focused um, on how to preserve existing affordability that's in the neighborhood and not just the affordable uh, 
homes, but also uh, to preserve the local economy, preserve uh, the local community, make sure that artists and the community can are not displaced and have the ability to stay uh, in this neighborhood. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, issues with uh, flooding, uh, specifically near the uh, waterfront, and how uh, there's potential for new housing to um, have more flood mitigation uh, efforts into it to help uh, so that the new sewer systems would be able to support um, any new housing that was put into the community. Uh, we also talked a lot about the need for real, true, deep affordability, um, making sure that uh, any new homes are not just luxury homes, but are affordable to the community members that live in the uh, neighborhood. And then I can touch on some of the goals. We did, I think we kind of ran out of time talking about the goals, but I believe we can sum them up pretty quickly. Uh, yes, again, heard a lot about preserving the existing community and local economy. Uh, one housing goal is to challenge assumptions and really think about creative solutions uh, to create deep affordability, not just use the existing tools that we have, but uh, try to create uh, new tools to create affordable housing. Uh, and again, preserve the existing affordable housing that's in the neighborhood and rent stabilized housing. Uh, and limit uh, the amount of luxury housing that's built in the neighborhood um, and prevent displacement of existing community members. Thank you, Duncan, very much for helping to summarize some of what was discussed in the first breakout room. Moving into breakout room number two, I'm gonna hand it over to Connie to please walk us through a little bit of what was discussed. Sure. I think something that was really striking, I think, in our conversation um, around this framework was certainly the need for affordability, but a lot of it was around kind of what's needed for families and households that live in the housing. So a lot of it was around kind of, you know, what are the amenities that are needed? Let's safeguard the transportation assets. Like if we're going to have housing here, these are all the things that are kind of inter like intimately related to housing that folks in the neighborhood would need. Um, so that was kind of one thing that stood out to me in this framework. In terms of the goals that we discussed, um, I think some of the themes that really uh, came through in our discussion, one was there was a very strong kind of uh, green resiliency theme, a lot of comments around the need for kind of uh, types of green infrastructure support for kind of resilient green kind of habits. Um, there was a theme around kind of NYCHA, both the need to invest in the existing uh, NYCHA itself, but also support for folks in NYCHA, for example, to have pathways to homes outside of NYCHA potentially with assistance towards, you know, applying through house Housing Connect. Um, I think that the deep affordability and kind of like 100% affordable and really pushing the boundaries of potentially what we have as existing city tools was certainly a very hot topic as well. So how can we get more than, you know, how can we get 100% affordable, deeper affordability, 30% caps for rent for everyone, um, really kind of thinking blue sky on what would be uh, desired from an affordable housing perspective. Thank you very much, Connie, for sharing out some of the conversation in the second breakout room. All right, moving into our third breakout room, I will invite, um, I know Joshua had some audio trouble, so maybe I'll invite Karen, I think you were in that breakout room to share out. Yeah, so um, some of the key things we focused on had to do uh, with affordability and just like AMI levels um, being too high, um, also facing the fact that um, the real estate market um, is also just too expensive right now um, to build more af affordable options um, and questions regarding um, how we can safeguard um, affordability with new housing um, coming down the pipeline in the future. Um, and so with, with that, we ended up focusing on um, one main goal, uh, really uh, surrounding uh, the generation of new housing specifically affordable housing um, and how the conversation went um, regarding how we can achieve that was um, kind of uh, 
mentioning the need that uh, we need more data on uh, vacancy numbers in uh, affordable units um, and getting more robust information on that um, to, to strive to um, achieve uh, a more diverse uh, affordability options. And then the other, um, the other thing that came up was uh, the, the desire to support community land trust um, and also just uh, recognizing that the city is also um, willing and, and desires to support this. Um, so this collaboration between community and, and the city is, is something that um, is um, pretty hopeful for, for LIC's future. Thank you very much, Bree, for sharing. All right, I'm coming into our fourth breakout room, and I'll ask that Winnie please share out a little bit of what was discussed in your conversation. Yeah, so for the framework, um, we had a really robust conversation about the need for affordable housing, um, particularly uh, units of larger sizes, like two or three bedrooms for families, so there's a need for more family size units in Long Island City. Um, there's also a conversation about a balance between having more market housing as well and not just, you know, affordable housing, um, but definitely a need for like affordable housing, also like senior housing. Um, we also called out the need for more home ownership opportunities as well in the neighborhood. Um, and then for things that were missing, we looked at like need for more indoor open spaces for folks to congregate in um, potentially, um, as well as more artist workspaces and artist specific housing. Um, and then we sort of dove a little bit past housing, but talked a bit about like general streetscape improvements of improved wayfinding. Um, another thing that came up for our group was about how to improve resiliency measures and recognizing the waterfront and how we can preserve open space and access to the waterfront. And then finally, just preserving the existing space that um, LIC has for makers and artists. Um, and then I think we also talked about um, how to do more affordable housing in this particular neighborhood um, and what that could look like and what deep affordability might mean, as well as recognizing that a lot of the study areas in the IBZ and that that's a priority to preserve the IBZ, um, how exactly we can still develop more housing while also preserving the IBZ. Um, and then again, highlighting the need for more housing opportunities for families and the need for those larger unit sizes. Uh, and there was a note about, uh, I guess very quickly, I'll do the goals um, for I uh, like last eight, slide eight, uh, just keep going for one more. Perfect, thank you. Um, but just in general, prioritizing affordable housing development and fostering rental and home ownership opportunities are possible and prioritizing um, what like Connie's group was talking about, about green building, green infrastructure. Thank you very much, Winnie. I'm gonna move to our next group here. And I'm going to go ahead and invite Laura to please share out uh, some of the highlights of your conversation. Sure. So um, in our group, we discussed how um, mixed income and mixed use development in the surrounding area um, has done well, um, which means that there is an opportunity for um, this type of development to also dwell in the existing study area that we're looking at and to potentially scale um, the use of MIA. Um, in addition, um, you know, being in favor of density um, to increase opportunities to increase the availability for affordable units um, and having these affordable units be tailored to diverse um, populations, especially for seniors and families. Um, and then in addition to that, really supporting the surrounding amenities such as access to transportation, um, parks, family-friendly spaces, and um, more um, connected streetscapes for um, better pedestrian experience. Um, in addition, we talked a little bit about some of the isolation that um, areas, for example, north of Queens Plaza experience and um, you know some of the um, experience with experiences with heavy traffic and just kind of being away from some of the, the main businesses and how that has impacted um, some of the folks living in um, different areas um, in that region. Um, and then also wanting more data um, specifically on, you know, where affordable units could potentially be um, located after the rezoning. Um, and also specific numbers in terms of what is possible. Um, and I 
think that's that's it for us. Thank you very much for the report, Aunt Laura. All right, I'm going to go to our next group here, and I'll invite Joy to please share back. So for the potential in our framework, our group uh, thought that there is a tremendous potential to increase housing supply. And because we may need to increase the housing supply so, so much, um, there is also a potential to increase affordability and also mixed use housing at all different AMI levels. What's currently missing is that um, there, you know, uh, is not as much connection with how affordable housing or housing can be developed in a more resilient way. Um, and we need to balance more housing with open space development. And, um, you know, we need a lot more balance between affordable housing and market rate housing. And some of the challenges that we discussed was that the process can be very lengthy in terms of the ULIP process, as well as the public review process. And, um, uh, also, deeply affordable buildings are extremely difficult to build on public land. And to safeguard um, the process, developers should be more transparent. They should be um, they should disclose their financials, and they should also um, find ways to increase the opportunity to create like microgrids and incentivize um, ways to collaborate more directly with um, with with the community. Um, and then for our goals um, that we agreed on, which is on slide number eight, um, the group that uh, said that they agree that new housing has to be resilient and sustainable as well as 100% affordable on public land. They also agreed as a group that they need we need to define what significant means, like what is the quantification of that number or percentage um, to define what the amount of affordable housing is. And to balance that affordability with um, an equal like look at market rate housing to meet that need. Our group also agreed that there are opportunities to find innovative solutions to addressing um, housing, um, in, such as conversions from commercial space to residential space, um, especially for young people or like single person households, um, and that affordable housing and housing development needs to be looked at holistically and not just in a vacuum of, you know, housing and, um, yeah, just as a vacuum and also in relationship to community resources that are already existing, such as open space connections and connections to regional transportation networks like Amtrak and Metro North. Thank you so much, Joy, for sharing out. And then finally, I'll just ask and check in. Kevin and Derek, was the interpreted uh, discussion room uh, used? OK, I'm getting a note from my, my tech yeah. person, Olivia. Thank you. All right, folks, that then wraps us up on the breakout room report back. First off, thank you all very, very much for joining us in that discussion. We really appreciate your thoughts here. Uh, as is noted, um, this is the beginning to a process. There's a lot more for us to discuss as we move it, move ahead. We get into the subsequent meetings here. We'll get into more housing-focused meetings. We're excited to meet with you in person around the table, hopefully break down some of the tech barriers here and have a face-to-face -face conversation with folks in Long Island City. So excited to get in the room with folks. Uh, before we break for the evening, I just want to talk about a couple next steps as we continue on in this process. The first is that I just hope everybody stays connected with us. Uh, like I said, this is going to be an ongoing process for the next several months. We want to ensure that as the process continues, people know where to find us, what meetings are going on, and you can use the website as a resource to understand what we've heard so far, the report outs from every session like this and subsequent sessions, as well as from the kickoff meeting are gonna be available. Kickoff meeting is already available at licplan.nyc. That is the website for this project. The other thing I'll ask folks to do there is please sign up for the mailing list of this project on that website. That's gonna be the best way for folks to stay informed about when and where we're meeting about updates and the progress of the project 
and where we need folks' thoughts as we continue on in this planning process. The next thing I'll give a little plug for is that we have a couple more meetings that are coming up later this month. We'll be discussing a couple other topics that were not the focus of our discussion today, although many of them came up in the way that planning is such an intersectional work. The first of those is the meeting focusing on economic development and workforce development, arts and culture, and community resources like education and schools. That meeting is going to be on Saturday, December 16th from 2.30 to 4.30 p.m. You can register at the link there or by scanning the QR code. This information is also available on the website, licplan.nyc. The next meeting after that will be the public realm, transportation, waterfront resiliency, and open space meeting. So thinking about all those transportation connections that started to come up here as we talked about transit-oriented development and the ways that open space may be a benefit, may be of best use and resource to the area. And we hope that you'll join us at those at that meeting on Monday, December 18th. That meeting will be from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. And once again, you can register and find all the information about that meeting at licplan.org. So folks, thank you very much for joining us for this evening's meeting. Once again, thank you for giving your time, volunteering it uh, on a weekday night to talk through something so important to all of us. And uh, I thank you and hope that you'll stay involved in the process as we move ahead. All right, thank you very much, folks. And have a good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.